mercy and peace are yours in abundance from God our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our text for our meditation this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out from the man. He brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The Christian friends, in Genesis chapter 1, we have the newspaper headline Twitter feed of the creation of the world. In Genesis chapter 2, we have basically the same information, only it's the Dateline NBC 60-minute um, version. It's more in-depth. It's the Newsweek article that goes on for six pages or Time magazine. Jesus, our God, is going in-depth in Genesis chapter 2 to cover what happened with the creation of man and woman. So we have that, and you're going to see the perfect marriage. It was. It is the gift of a loving God, and marriage is a blessing to husbands and wives still today. Look at verse 18 once more. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. We are in perfection. This is before the fall into sin, and there is no superlative in the Hebrew language. So when you read the creation account, and there was evening and there was morning the first day, and God blessed the animals and he blessed creation and it was good, when God says it's good, it's perfect. And so when God says it is not good, something's not quite right yet. It's not perfect. All right? Not quite good enough yet. And just as you could say that, not good is kind of an understatement. When you hear our God say, I will make a helper suitable for him, that's kind of underwhelming also. That's not to say that man's best friend could be, well, anything. You have to understand that all of the animals came before Adam. God didn't just give Adam a wife and say, here you go. There was a, there's a process that he went through. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I will make a helper a helper suitable for him. This is something that our society chafes under. We don't like to think about the differences between men and women, and yet our God accentuates them and raises them up. There's an interdependency that men and women have in between each other. You'll see that in any marriage. There are certain areas that are missing in a man, and there are certain areas that are missing in a woman. This is why opposites attract. Because you see what is missing in yourself, and you see how this other person completes. That's part of why, in a marriage, you can accomplish more. Now, let's consider the roles that were covered in our second lesson. Um, from Ephesians, God talks about how the role of a man is to love. Well, no one has a problem with loving. And yet the role of a woman in a marriage is to submit. And the problem is that that is the picture of submission so often. It's a doormat. That's completely false. What I want you to get into your head is not that. Nowhere does anyone say in the Bible that submission means that someone has to hold women down. That's wrong. 
That's the picture of submission. Where you place yourself under someone else's leadership. I can't even tell who the quarterback is there. Maybe the guy on the top leaning in. Well, do you think anyone in that huddle is going, why does he always get to call the play? No, they just say, let's go forward. We're a team. We're going to make this happen. And do you think the quarterback once in a while goes, guys, that didn't work real well. I didn't play football. I've never been in a huddle. Once in a while, there's probably some feedback that goes back to the quarterback, right? The same thing happens in America. There's this interdependency. This communication goes back and forth between men and women, between the head and the helper. And so I want you to get out of your head anything bad in society and see marriage as a gift from God. That's what it is. This is God's design. There is equality among the sexes, though, I have to tell you. One way that men and women are perfectly equal is that we're both fallen sinners. I haven't yet met a woman who's perfect in every way. All women are sinners. And guys, we're sinners too. And so, in that way, we stand before our God, sinful and under His judgment. And yet, we're also equally sane. When Jesus came, He died on the cross, not just for men or women, He died for both of us. And so, we are united in our sinfulness, and we're also united under Jesus' grace, and under the forgiveness that is ours. And as forgiven and redeemed children of God, we go forward... And we look at the gift that God's given us in marriage. Well, let's jump back in now. We're at verse 19, and this is how it went down. This is where women came from. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. How many of you have a picture of Adam that he was this knuckle grating, knuckle dragging Neanderthal with a club over one arm? And he had to go out and club a saber tooth tiger. And then maybe at night he would take a rock and carve something on a cave wall. It's kind of ridiculous. The pictures that we get from evolution do not do justice to how smart Adam probably was. He looked at something and he saw it and then he named it. Creation was complete and Adam was probably a smart guy before the fall into sin. I'm going to say that. There was nothing that was beyond his grasp. Did he know what a computer was? Probably not. Could he understand integrated circuitry? Of course. We haven't really gotten any smarter over the years. We've just discovered more things. Adam had all the abilities that you did and so did Eve. We were perfect people. Well, what God is doing here is he's lining up creation before Adam, and Adam figures out, wait a second here, there's two rhinoceros, there's two giraffes. What's going on here? There's only one of me. He's alone. And God wanted him to see that he was alone. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Again, that's an understatement. There's no one to complete Adam. So, the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken from the man. There's something beautiful about how God did did this. He could have just said, Adam, watch this, and made Eve out of the dust of the ground just like he did Adam. But he didn't. He took a rib from Adam while he was asleep. This wasn't a painful surgical process. And he made a woman from part of him. This was part of himself. That's how he was to treat me. An incredible gift of God. Some have said God could have taken you know, part of Adam's foot so that he could trample over Eve. Or God could have taken part of Adam's head so that Eve could rule over him. But in his wisdom, God took A rib from Adam, so that Eve could be by his side and be close to him. That, I think, is beautiful in the symbolism that God built into this. Well, and again, this is where it gets romantic. So we have intelligence and romance, guys. Women still like that today. 
That's what Adam showed Eve. He brought her to the man. This is God. God brings Eve to the man. And the man said, now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is beautiful. The first proposal, I don't know if the sun was setting or if they're on the shore of the Tigris River and he got down on one knee. There's just so much that we don't know about this, and yet that's poetry right there. It's in the Hebrew language. It's kind of a rough translation into the English, but beautiful. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with writing poetry. Still today, no matter how long you've been married, women still like poetry, that you took the time to do it. That's good. Well, we can go into this, and you'll see, I hit this in the children's message, but this is the definition of marriage. Mutually given and freely. This is consent. Verse 24, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now, there's more to marriage than just a mutual consent, freely given, freely received. There's all kinds of stuff in marriage, right? When you're one flesh, that of course talks about the sexual union. But that's not all there is to marriage, obviously. That's a priority, of course, in a marriage life. That's an expression of the union that God created. And yet, there's a spiritual union that you have as you worship God together. There's a union of goals. I tell couples, don't be floating in the breeze just going, well, what do you want to do today? Oh, there's something on TV. There's nothing against watching TV together. But, Figure out what you want to do with your life. You can accomplish more together than you could alone. The most obvious one, I suppose, is having kids. That's something that you can work at together. But it goes beyond that. You can work together to build a home, whether that involves a house or an apartment or whatever your home may be. Maybe you can improve yourself. I don't know. But... It brought out in that lesson from Ephesians, if there's something that you don't like about your spouse, what can you do? Well, you have the perfect marriage here. So there's nothing wrong with Adam and Eve. I'm sorry to say that all of you have some deficiencies because of the fall into sin. Well, don't try to change your spouse. I'm going to tell you that. What you can do is look inside yourself and change yourself. Jesus is the greatest agent for change the world has ever seen. And so if there's something missing in your life or something that you don't like about it, you can change it. That you can do. And so, there are some who look at marriage today and think, well, is it outdated? You've probably heard the stats. I, I looked some up. They're extremely conflicting. There's so many. People write polls with the sole purpose of having a stat at the end of it. It's called push polling. And so I kind of wonder how much of these are reliable. But if you look at most places, the rule of thumb is that one out of two marriages ends in divorce. And there are some who see the marriage rate going down. The, sorry, the divorce rate going down. But that's because the marriage rate is going down too. You've heard me say that the millennials generation that was born right around 2000, give or take five or ten years, those folks are kind of leading the church those folks are also kind of leaving marriage. Because they wonder, what's the point of getting married? If I love you and you love me, let's just get married. Sorry, let's just live together. 75% of all couples, before they even get married, includes Protestants, Catholics, Christians, have lived together before they get married. And there are some who get extremely worried at the state of marriage with the recent events in our country. Gay marriage is now the law of the land. What can be our response to that? Well, I think it's the same response with any time you see something that goes contrary to God's word. That's just law and gospel. Be loving and honest with people when they ask you. Gay marriage is not God's plan for anyone's life. And yet, that doesn't mean that there's no forgiveness. No matter what sin someone is guilty of, well, there's forgiveness for it. And frankly, when you look at how Christians have treated marriage, I have a hard time getting upset about gay marriage. I think before we go outside this room and this congregation to see the problems in the world, 
we should look at ourselves. And with a sharp knife of God's law, we should go into our own heart and see where have I been selfish? Where have I been lazy? Where is there a grudge that I have not forgiven? And then, apply the grace to our spouse too. Apply that grace to our children. Bring God's Word back into a home. God's Word was in this first home because God walked and talked with Adam and Eve. I can't imagine how wonderful that would be. Well, you can still, may not walk, but you can still talk to your God. As a couple, as a family, you can pray together. And you can talk to God and you can hear Him speak back to you as you have time and devotion with Him. Take a little chunk of God's Word and meditate on it. Talk about it with your family and your children. Ask them, what do they see in school? Try to answer the question. And if you can't, say, I don't know. Be honest with them. And then go find the answer. You can ask me, or our church body has plenty of resources online if you'd like more information. The perfect example of a marriage is right before you, in Adam and Eve. And yet, while that perfect example didn't last very long, and it's gone from the face of the earth. That doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with marriage. Marriage is a gift from a loving God, and it is still a blessing to husbands and wives. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We praise our God with the Create in Me found in your worship folder.